morning, everybody, and welcome to Nailsy Baptist Church this morning. Uh, my name is Sue, and I'm going to be leading our worship today. First of all, a couple of notices. Wouldn't be church without notices, would it? Um, if you've got any prayer requests, or you feel that God is asking you to share something with the fellowship, then you can text Peter, or you can use the YouTube comments function if you can work out how to do that. I haven't yet. <laughs> uh, please feel free to join in. We're live, so you can participate just as if you were physically in the building. And the second notice is that Claire has asked me to prepare you for her talk a little later. Each person, adults and children, will need a metal spoon. She doesn't specify a size, but it has to be metal, apparently. I'm intrigued for later. So, as we start our service, I want to tell you about my latest earworm. Do you ever get a tune or lines of a song that you just can't get rid of out of your head? I find myself bursting into song at random moments, and sometimes I even sing them in my sleep. Anyway, we as a family watched the musical Hamilton lately, and I've had some words sung by King George going round in my head ever since. They are these. When push comes to shove, I'll send a large battalion to remind you of my love. Now, why on earth do I have that going round in my head? It has driven me mad. But then I started thinking about God and what these words would mean in the context of God. When push comes to shove, I'll send a large battalion to remind you of my love. And this is what God said to me. Your king, your God, didn't wait till push came to shove. I willingly just at the right time, gave my only son, Jesus, to die for you, to remind me, you, of my love. God, our King, is on our side, loving us whether we acknowledge it or not, and to remind us of his love, he sent Jesus. Let's celebrate that as we worship together.
thank you, Father, that you willingly sent Jesus to bear my sin and my shame. That by your grace, not my own goodness or effort, you have set me free to be your beloved child. No one else could have done it. Jesus, you're the only one good enough. Thank you that you have reminded me of your love through the power of the cross. You are worthy of my praise. Ground beneath quakes as 
as we sit in your presence. Thank you that wherever we are, we can feel your presence now. That we have raised you high with our praise. And we want you to stay high on our praise, Lord, enthroned in the heavens, not brought down to our level. We lift you up because you are worthy of our praise. Amen.
hopefully you've got all the messages and you have a metal spoon or you can go and run and get one or have a look later now have a look at yourself on the inside of the spoon so the bit that you'd normally have your cereal on have a look at yourself hopefully you can see your reflection what is wrong with your reflection you're upside down oh dear this is a little bit what we are like without Jesus. Turn your spoon around and look at your reflection on the outside of the spoon. What's happened to your reflection? Hopefully you are the right side up. And when we think we are okay without God, that we can be our own king and do things our own way, we are upside down like the inside of our spoon. But when we realise that we ignore God and when we say sorry to God and we turn around, we can get to know God, the one who made all things and we can be the right way up. So you can remember that when you have your cereal or your pudding or make a cup of tea with a spoon, you can look at your reflection and think about what it means to turn around and be the right way up. We're going to start sing our God is a great big God because he is big, he is all powerful, he made everything and he loves each one of us. Have a great half term everyone and we'll see you next Sunday. Bye! I'm going to read um, today's reading to you. Um, if you'd like to follow in your Bibles, it's in 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, and starting at verse 2. 
to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptise any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptised in my name. Uh, Yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. 
Thank you, Sue, very much uh, for reading that so well. I encourage you, uh, to, if you've got a Bible on your lap, to hold it there, um, because I'll be referring to different phrases from that uh, lengthy but detailed reading that uh, Sue brought us. Very good morning from me. It's great to be able to speak with you in this way. Uh, I, for one, am sorry that we can't all gather together just as we could a number of months ago. But hey, at least we're able to do this. And uh, don't forget, this is interactive. So if you want to um, pass on a prayer request or a word of encouragement or something, text me and uh, I'll pick it up straight away. Now, I started this series, which uh, I called Wholehearted Christian Living, a few weeks ago now. And as I started, I used the reminder from Romans that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Through Christ, we've been given access into a worldwide, timeless, and kind of interconnected family who belong to God as Father. We are, first and foremost, we are citizens of heaven, no more than, than temporal residents of this world. We're, we're passing through to a new kingdom, a, a fabulous eternity, and a glorious inheritance. But all of that, all of that reality, all of that truth demands uh, certain things of us. And, and my hope is that as we go through this series, or as we have gone through this series, we've got a couple more weeks to go, but we can work through what it means, what it means on the day-to-day -day basis to live as radical disciples of Jesus now, many of you will know by now that one of my observations about the society that we find ourselves in is the, uh, how commonly people place their dependence upon uh, other things. Some look to money uh, or possessions. If only I had this bigger house, then I could depend upon all of that. Some seek perfect health or, or uh, a first-class education or a flourishing career. If only I could reach the top of the ladder, then I'll be okay. I can depend upon that. They depend, many people depend upon these temporary areas for their safety, for their sanity. But as recent times have revealed to us or reminded us again and again, health or wealth or wisdom or many other things can diminish oh so very quickly. And any reliance we place upon these shaky foundations, well, will only serve to, to remind us of the application of Jesus' teaching about the guy who tried to build a house on sand and how everything came crashing down in the storms of life. So where is our dependence to be? On what or who should we be leaning? And what does that look like? How, how the heck do we, um, do we do this? Do we place our dependence upon somebody when life around us is so chaotic? Well, Paul, in the opening chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us some good ideas as he begins to unpack his understanding of what Christ has won for us. So look first at verses 2 to 9, that first block, and we can see that Paul encourages us to be thankful for God's grace, to be thankful for God's grace. Now, like those early Corinthians, we who make up God's church today are sanctified. That's a word he uses. We're literally being, we have been made holy. In Christ Jesus, we are called to live then as holy, sanctified, set apart people. We are those uh, who have looked to him and who continue to look for him in all things. We depend upon him. 
Now, those who've turned their backs on God, those who, who have their lives upside down, as Claire illustrated for us, those who ignore the teachings of Jesus, those who, who refuse to have any meaningful relationship with God through uh, all that Jesus offers us, well, there are worldly people. They are in and of this world. They seek to gain their delight from earthly pleasures. They live for themselves, ignoring this persistent calling of what it means to be an image bearer of Almighty God. So instead of that, well, what are we to do? You see, in contrast to those who are of this world, we who uh, accept and embrace the teachings of Jesus, we who want to live as radical disciples are to be different. Uh, again, we're not to conform to the ways of this crazy, unholy world, this God-rejecting uh, society. We are to be transformed, molded, changed into something very, very different. And Paul makes it clear that this opportunity for change, this revelation of a new way of living, a, a way of living differently from the society around us, does not come, a, come about because, well, because we're somehow special. We're not called into God's family because we deserve it any more than anybody else. Uh, we're not given this opportunity because we're so much cleaner or, or talented or more deserving. We cannot be any, any of these things, but because of God's grace, solely because he has deigned to visit us in the person, the example, the Savior who is Jesus, we are given this opportunity. Look at verse 4, because of his grace, God gives us the only one who can give us access to him. Because of his grace, God, God gifts us with every spiritual gift as we eagerly await the revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 7. Because of his grace, our faithful creator God calls us into the closest of friendships with him. This is incredible. This is remarkable. This is wonderful. This is the kind of news that, that should blow our minds and stir our hearts. Just stop for a moment and think about how worthy you are. Be honest with yourself. You know the truth better than anyone. To pick up that phrase that I, I picked on uh, last week from Psalm 8, what is this man, this person, that you are mindful of him. And yet, even though God knows the truth, even though God knows more about our faults and our failings than we would ever, ever care to admit to anybody else, because of his grace, his freely given, undeserved, magnificent righteousness, we are made not just a little bit good, not just uh, moderately favoured. Because of his grace, we are made holy. Holy or righteous enough to somehow be welcomed into the holy of holies and adopted into the family of of God. That's how special you are. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, that's the truth of what we have become because of him. So then, as those who are thankful for God's grace and within that, that wonderful relationship with him, which we can now delight in, we are also suddenly joined with others across every generation and any geographical boundary. And the next section, verses 10 to 17, remind us, as God's holy family, that we're to be committed to God's people. I don't know about you, but the, the biggest thing I've missed during the last six months, uh, six or seven months now, isn't it, is you, my church family. I've struggled. 
I've struggled emotionally and spiritually because I don't get the chance to spend quality time with you, chatting and laughing and praying and praising and weeping and just singing together and being together. Uh, I miss too the joy that we share through mutual acts of fellowship and support, the, the, the hubbub that goes on in the coffee shop, uh, the youth and children's activities, which are such a central part of church life, all the acts of service which we offer and readily accept from one another. All of this, all of this provides glimpses of how true family should work, how God's saints should benefit from one another in fellowship unity. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of all that God's family means. But some, though, have a different perspective. A Bible commentator, Simon Austin, uh, offers a, a fairly lengthy, quite painful, but I think quite true, assessment of church today. Listen to this. Our problem, Simon says, is that we tend to view church as a bus rather than an orchestra. There is a driver who does all the work and a series of passengers who enjoy the ride. They're often very proud of their bus. They like good driving. They can spot bad driving a mile off. They think that being on the bus is about having a great time, a buzz every time they meet. Now, many on the bus have been traveling for years, but they don't always know those who've got onto the bus at a later stop. In previous years, some have helped clean the bus and service the engine, but now they, well, they just talk about what they used to do. They still think it's a good idea to stop and pick up a few new passengers, but they don't really feel that that's their gift. One or two of them refuse to talk to anyone else on the bus. They're very particular about where they sit. And a few, well, a few just come along for the company. That's often the experience we have of church. But it's not the biblical picture of what church should be like. Church, Simon Austin goes on to say, should be like an orchestra in which everybody, everybody has a part to play if the music is to sound as the composer intended. It is essential for everybody to play from the same score to do what it says, and for the conductor to guide the orchestra through the piece in order to bring out what the composer had written. Only then, only then will the music come alive. Only then will the sound made match the intention of, the, of its creator. Without each instrument playing, it is incomplete. So with the church, he concludes, we must all play from the same score. We must all respond together. We must all serve one another faithfully with the gifts that we have been given. And we all need a conductor who will rightly teach the word in order that we might make the sound the composer intended. Friends, in order for this church to be the full-blown harmonious orchestra that God intended us to be, I believe we need to encourage and allow every instrument to play its part. Now, the perfect unity which Paul describes in verse 10 of our reading doesn't demand that we always agree on every point, but it does ask that we work together that we serve faithfully together, that we use together the gifts that God has blessed each of us with to ensure that the overall reality of true worship is unmistakably seen and unmissably heard. So to this end, let me remind you, those of you who are regulars here at NBC, let me remind you, we need people to step up we need people to step up into many roles, to help out in many different ways, not least at church secretary and church treasurer. Martin and Graham have faithfully served 
but they need to have a rest. These are just two examples of how we can all bring our gifts, we can all respond, we can all serve faithfully together. Please don't be a passenger, be a player. So Paul uh, calls the church to be thankful for God's grace. He calls the church to be committed to God's people. Thirdly, uh, from verse 18, he calls us to be reliant upon his word and spirit. Time is running out this morning to go into a lot of detail, but just notice in verse 23, the mission to which all who are wholehearted in discipleship uh, that we, we all carry that the radical disciple is to go on proclaiming the reality of Christ and all that he means to us. Now, we're not all necessarily gifted as preachers in the established understanding of the word, but we are all called, every Christian is called to, to share the reality of what Jesus means to us. How do you, how you do that well, it doesn't much matter, but how we do that must be seen. You see, sharing the reality of Christ's love is an essential element of being a disciple of His. Now, Paul makes clear in the rest of this passage that God deliberately chose weak vessels, and we know our own weaknesses very well, don't we? But God also enables and equips each of us with his power. The same power, just hang on to this for a second. This, this is remarkable, it's wonderful. The same power which raised Christ from the dead is in you. Do you get that? The very same power that, that caused the resurrection of Jesus the Christ is with you and with me. The same power, the same spirit, which Jesus himself knew that was in him and carried through him, uh, was then given out by him to all who are radical disciples. We can depend upon God's truth. We can depend upon God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for our every, every need. And most wonderfully, we can depend upon him to enable us to be reconciled with him and with one another and to live with joy the truth of his gospel. Friends, we should be able to depend upon one another as a, a local expression of his worldwide family. And as we allow God to do his work in our community, we depend upon his power to equip us and to enable us to break through every barrier that gets in the way of his love. Will you join with others in this place, in the vibrant orchestra of grace? Will you join with uh, us to not be of this world, but instead through word and action, as Paul concludes this chapter, to boast in the Lord? to brag about him, to not be able to shut up about him, to proclaim him as our king and to delight in the reality of his love. That's what it means to depend upon God. That's what it means to depend upon the, the, the salvation that Christ has won for us with all the power of God that is now made available to us. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you so much that you give us so much, that you've done so much for us. Uh, and thank you, Lord, that even in the tough um, reminders that we've had over the last few months that we can't rely on uh, perfect health or, or uh, jobs or, or whatever, that we can depend upon you. Thank you that you drive home to us the truth that we can rely and depend upon you all the time. So, Lord, help us to be a people, not only who are used to that, not only who get that, but who live that out for other people. 
Come, Holy Spirit, fill us afresh, I pray, for the glory of your name. Amen. Can I just encourage you, after the, this service finishes, at some stage when you've got 20 minutes, uh, tune in again to the YouTube channel. There's a sermon there from Gavin Calver that he shared with us. As a church, we're members of the Evangelical Alliance of the UK. And Gavin, the General Secretary, has, has uh, issued this sermon, which I just encourage you to have a look at. But let's praise God now for all that he's given us and all that he's done for us. I was just thinking as uh, Peter was talking at the end there about an incident several years ago when I was asked to play percussion in a um, production by local churches of Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Now, I have been in orchestras and bands all of my life, but playing the triangle was the most terrifying thing I've ever had to do. And the reason was that there were thousands of bars rest, and then I had to just go ting at the right moment. And um, every time we performed it, I missed my moment. And it, I was thinking, why was that so difficult for me? I'm, I'm a musician, I can do this. But actually, I think it's because it wasn't my job to do, really. I was doing it because there wasn't anybody else. And I think that God's just reminded me of that, just to say everybody's got their thing that they can do and that everybody needs to step up, as Peter's just said, because we've all got 
something we're good at and there is a triangle player out there that could take that burden from me forevermore, please. Before we sing our last song, let's just pray. Lord, we thank you that we are a fellowship of your people who are made to be an orchestra of grace. We pray for each one that you would give us our calling, our nudge, our prompting to fulfill our little bit of the picture. And Lord, because we all love you, we love one another, and we pray now for those who are unwell, for those with hospital appointments this week, we ask that you would go before them and that you would be in the skill of the doctors and the other people making diagnoses and offering treatment. Lord, be there by the power of your spirit. We pray for those with job uncertainty, job interviews, financial difficulties. Lord, there are so many pressures in our lives at the moment. And we pray for those who are worried about tomorrow that they would be able to depend on you for every second of every day and for every need. Lord, there are so many needs in our fellowship, but we bring them to you now uh, in the power of your spirit because nothing is too difficult for you. Please encourage us during the week to continue to pray for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. That uh, earworm that Sue mentioned right at the beginning of our service reminded me of a, a glorious verse in Psalm 34 and verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around his people. Friends, that's something we can depend upon. So as Psalm 34 opens, let us extol the Lord at all times. His praise always on our lips. Let us glory in the Lord and exalt his name together. Go in peace and know God's power during this week, wherever you are and whoever you're among. God is with you and God is for you. God bless you.